for a very clear and categorical uh, introduction. Our next speaker is uh, Patrick Brown, who's uh, going to contribute his perspective. Um, as already introduced this morning, he's a member of Parliament in Canada. He works uh, closely with the Canadian government on international affairs, and we're very happy to have him to share his views on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and it's, it was a privilege to speak this morning and we'll add a little bit of perspective uh, this afternoon uh, on the genocide. And I wanted to start uh, um, how um, I became aware uh, of the genocide. I think we all have our own personal stories about how we learnt uh, about the horrors. I mentioned uh, this morning that I had a family in Barrie that told me about what their family members were facing in the IDP camps. Uh, and we talked about this in the government caucus because this was something quite alarming. And we, we kept on hearing more and more of these stories and there was these giant protests we heard about and we wanted to find out more uh, about this deplorable situation. And um, the family in my riding, I said, oh, I want to go and help. And I, and I want to take a government delegation to Sri Lanka so we can assist, assist with uh, refugees that want to come to Canada, but also highlighting what was happening in Sri Lanka to try, try to shine uh, a light on it. And myself and an MP, uh, Paul Klandra, who is uh, also a member of the government and represents an area in Canada um, in Markham, uh, we uh, made our travel plans, we put our request for a visa in, uh, and right before we were going to go to Sri Lanka, um, and visit the IDP camps, our visa was denied. And for us, that was quite alarming um, because we had never had our visa denied going anywhere uh, as parliamentarians. Uh, and that was really a wake-up call for me that this was a government that was hiding something. And to not want to have any, any review of, what, of the conduct they were doing meant the conduct they were engaging in was something that was breaching uh, the laws of international justice. Uh, and there was a speaker earlier uh, today, a member of the British Parliament, who said he didn't want to go to Sri Lanka because they wouldn't give him the real show. They wouldn't allow him to visit and talk to Tamils about what was really happening. And, and certainly that's been my impression too. If there is um, high-level visits to Sri Lanka, they are given the government story. They're only taken to certain places, and it's, uh, it's all a show. It's all about their propaganda. Uh, and realizing that this government was uh, putting on a real propaganda show, it made me want to uh, learn a lot more and to look at ways in which we could assist um, in helping uh, the plight of the Tamil people in Canada uh, and, and to put a, um, a light on the genocide that was obviously happening. To illustrate what was happening in Canada at the time in 2009, um, where I mentioned earlier there's 200,000 in Toronto alone, 200,000 Tamil Canadians. Um, the Tamil Canadians showed tremendous courage by getting out in all forms of social media, uh, having massive protests in Toronto, massive protests in Ottawa, and that really awoke the country to what was happening. Uh, the headline of the Toronto Star in 2009, the front page was thousands protest ta Tamil genocide. There was over 30 front page newspaper stories about this. 45,000 people lined downtown Toronto streets for four frigid hours to beg the world for help with signs and banners, stop the genocide, send relief. Canadian newspapers have been sounding alarm bells ever since. With headlines like UN's failing, to, failing its duty to protect civilians during conflicts. The Toronto Star also had another headline, the UN failed Sri Lanka Tamils and innocent people paid the price. And I think it's important that uh, we're starting to see the media and politicians to take uh, this, this cause up. The UN Convention defines genocide as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, or in a whole part, a national, ethnic, or racial, or religious group. Killing members of a group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group, deliberately inflict inflicting on a group conditions of life calculated to bring about a physical destruction in whole or part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group, forcibly transferring the children of the group to another group. It is clear to me that if not, if not some, but, but almost all of these have applied to the situation in Tamil. 
in, uh, in the Tamil parts of Sri Lanka. This conflict has been going on for decades. It, that itself indicates the intention of the Sri Lankan state to marginalize the Tamil community. In doing so, the intention has been a systematic scale, the destruction inflicted upon the Tamil community. It certainly is a genocide and has been a genocide. Just last month, the United Nations top human rights officials faulted Sri Lanka for failing to investigate the reports of widespread killings and other atrocities towards the end of its bloody quarter century civil war. In her report to the 47 Nation Human Rights Council, High Commissioner for Human Rights Navi Pillay also stated that opposition leaders are still being killed and abducted and the government has made no arrest or persecutions in the cases of the disappearances. It is incumbent upon Sri Lanka to start behaving like a member of the Commonwealth. It is unacceptable that they did not sign on to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court because as long as there's no accountability for the massacres that occurred during the Civil War and the ongoing terror that continues today, there can never be sustainable peace amongst ethnic communities. The Sri Lankan government spares no one that criticize them. Many journalists have experienced this firsthand as some of them are dead, missing, or in exile in jail. We are very fortunate in Canada to live in a, a, in a safe country, and it's almost unbelievable to hear the stories that have happened. I felt compelled to come to this conference, uh, and I'm actually only here today. I, I flew in last night, and I'm leaving this afternoon because I have duties back in Canada. But I wanted to come to, to speak about why it is uh, such a horrendous situation. And I said this morning in the, in the closing of my speech that I believe the internal mechanisms to bring accountability have failed, and I have no hope that the internal mechanisms will work. And I believe that parliamentarians in whatever country they reside, we need to push um, within our uh, foreign affairs ministries that we should push for the UN's responsibility to protect as a third pillar applies. And I think the reality is that if the UN does not uh, adopt this and recognize that they have the, the duty to protect, um, it will only diminish the UN. I remember hearing uh, after the genocide um, in Rwanda, and people said, never again. And it's really sad that the, we're not learning from the lessons of history. And this is an opportunity, f if the UN was to seize it, to enhance the reputation as a, as a body that has the ability to be meaningful. Otherwise, I think it would be very unfortunate for the United Nations. And I can tell you that um, the government of Canada, our prime minister and our foreign minister, are very um, eager and enthusiastic to use the Canadian voice at the Commonwealth and at the UN to press for immediate action that goes beyond the internal mechanisms that the Sri Lankan government seem are adequate because they are unequivocally not acceptable and will not realize peace or justice at any point. And thank you for your time, and thank you for listening to me once again today.